Okay. I'd like to welcome everybody to um, for uh, calling in today and getting on our presentation. Um, we're going to talk about water pressure reducing valves today. Um, we're going to go over um, why we have them, how they operate, a little bit of sizing info, and why you should choose watts when you're looking for water pressure regulators. Um, again, I appreciate you getting on, and we will jump right into it here. So first, why do we have water pressure regulators? So three reasons why we have them. One's kind of the same. We have four uh, pictures up there, but conservation and preservation. If you are running a plumbing system at say a hundred, a very high pressure of like 150 psi, you are using twice as much water out of a faucet as if you were running that system at 50 psi. So if you can imagine taking that water bill you get every three months and doubling it, that's quite a substantial savings by just reducing that pressure to a more um, suitable flow rate and uh, gives you a lot of cost savings and of course the preservation of our natural resource. Um, Secondly, is for safety. We have faucets, shower valves, other things in our piping system that aren't rated to take high pressures that we may see in city water mains inside our buildings. So we gotta make sure that we're not flooding buildings by causing leaks or blowing fittings apart, and that uh, we're also considering the safety of everyone in the building as well without rupturing pipes or things that they may be near. May be near. Um, and lastly is regulation. Our um, code is what another thing that really drives it. So Ohio is an international plumbing code state, so the IPC standard 604.8, along with UPC and NSPC, all state that a plumbing system should not be above 80 PSI in a building. So why do we need pressure reducing valves kind of comes in the thought like, well, why don't we just run it at 80 PSI? Well, if we look at city mains and the distribution of water through a town, you will have a large main running down the street serving thousands of houses and facilities, businesses, whatever it may be. And every time someone opens a faucet, as you guys know, you're going to see a pressure drop in that line. So municipalities have to run booster pumps at high PSIs, maybe up to 200 PSI in a city main, so that with all the opening and closing in the system, uh, we maintain a good constant pressure in that in that building or in the area for all the buildings. Um, this can also be affected by where you are in the city, how far away you are from the pump house, um, elevation of where you may be. If you're up on a hill, you may need that extra PSI to get up that hill and overcome that foot ahead. Um, and you'll be at a nice lower water pressure at that point. Or if you're in a low-lying area, you may need that pressure reducing valve um, put in to take you down to a more reasonable 50, 60 PSI, like we show on this slide for homes and small businesses. Um, we do see elevated pressure systems, of course, in high-rises where we have molly stories um, and we have uh, uh, pressure boosting systems typically in them. And you may see pressure reducing valves if the booster pump is on the first floor in the basement and it's pushing up 20 floors, you'll see pressure reducing valves uh, staged, uh, one, one for floors one through five, one for floors six through 12 maybe, because um, you're getting that pressure drop as you go up. And then at the top floors, you wouldn't have any pressure reducing valves at all. So different requirements and some of the reasoning why we have them. So what is a PRV? A PRV is a mechanical device that regulates the incoming water pressure to a lower consistent downstream pressure. Um, our direct acting PRVs are commonly um, have a spring range of 25 to 75 PSI and coming out of the factory set at 50 PSI. Um, but we have a large variety of pressure regulators, probably the um, largest breadth of product on the market. Um, there are two different types. We have a pilot operated, or which most people are familiar with, our ACV line, like our LFM115s, 
and uh, the direct acting models, like our LF25 AUBs and our U5Bs or our N55s. So today we're mostly talking, we're specifically talking about the direct acting valves. Um, we, we differentiate these products through uh, market segments. And a lot of this is determined by flow rates. When we see commercial, industrial, institutional applications, we're usually talking about really high flow rates. So we're talking typically in these applications, valves that are three inches or larger. And that's where we like to see our 223s or our, our ACVs, our pilot-operated ones, uh, that carry a larger flow rate uh, for those larger facilities. Um, and the next segment would be the residential, where you see our M55s, N45s. And we show our 25 AUBs and LFU5Bs there which those are definitely um, great valves for a residential application, um, but we do use them a lot in commercial, light commercial work um, where we have smaller flow rates, um, and, but want a good, robust valve, particularly our LFU5B. Um, it's very robust. Um, it's very good at handling sediment and particles in the water. And then, of course, we have specialty um, market segment, which would be laboratory equipment, maybe beverage dispensers where we're having small diameters, maybe lower pressure ranges that we need on some equipment. And those are typically quarter or three-eighths in uh, pipe size. So if we look at the internals of our PRVs, um, all of our PRVs, direct acting, are re completely repairable without removing the valve from the line. So some important internal components of the PRVs we offer. First would be the inlet strainer. Um, this would be the take the cutaway of a 25 AUB. So we have an inlet uh, strainer on all our valves, which is accessible through the bottom. Um, just a plug you take off to clean the screen out. This will protect the valve from any debris or fissure that might come in the water and clog up the mechanisms inside the valve, holding the valve either open or closed. Uh, next is comparison here of your diaphragm and our seat. If you look at the two diameters there, the water coming in through the strainer and going down and pushing down on the seat or disc assembly, on the disc assembly, lifting it off the seat, pushing it downward, um, allows water to flow through. So if we have 50 PSI coming in on our supply pressure, as that valve opens, it's going to start to allow 50 PSI downstream of the valve. The water downstream of the valve then will start to push up on the diaphragm, which is roughly one and a half times larger than the disc it's pushing down on. So if we're pushing down with 50 PSI, we're going to be pushing up with 150 PSI. It'll be one and a half times. Um, this will help throttle the valve closed. We use our adjusting screw on the top, um, driving it in and pushing down on that spring pressure to open the valve and increase our line pressure. So the harder we're pushing down, the more we're opening it, allowing more flow through. As flow comes through, it'll push up on the diaphragm. Next, I have a little animation that shows this, but I just like to show that slide because it's easier to explain at my own pace than watching this video. But here's an animation of the water flow through the valve. So same valve, same cutaway. We have water entering from the left from the supply side, um, going through the strainer, and you're going to see it start to put a downward force on our disc, throttling the valve open. If you see, it's moving, lifting off the seat. As that stays open, you're going to get that water pressure equalizing across that seat to up, both upstream and downstream and starting to apply a upward force on the diaphragm. So now we're pushing up on the diaphragm and starting to throttle the valve closed. So this is where we would start limiting the downstream pressure by limiting the flow through the valve.
that's what the flow through the valves will look like. Um, now that we know how they work, we can talk a little bit about how do we size them? What do we do when a customer calls in and says, hey, I need a PRV for a two-inch line. What do we need to know? And um, what are the specifics? Do I just need to know line size or do I need to know more than that? I don't know. So some terms we need to know, one would be supply pressure. This is going to be your pressure upstream of the valve, upstream of the PRV, or just coming into your building before your PRV is there. So for sizing the valve, we need to know the supply pressure. Again, the incoming water pressure from the city supply. Um, we also would be curious about the static pressure in the system. Um, are we seeing any, this will help us if we compare the supply pressure to the static pressure, um, we may see some spiking, like maybe overnight during shutdown periods from thermal expansion, which we'll uh, reference later. But static pressure is your pressure in the system with no flow and all your fixtures closed. Next would be dynamic pressure. Dynamic pressure is a pressure in your system when you have your fixtures open, open and operating. So you have flows going through the system, and like we talked about the municipal mains, as those things are open, we're going to see pressure drops. We want to talk about sizing. We want to know how many gallons per minute is going to be required in a facility. So we want to know the incoming water pressure and how much water they're going to need in the system and their desired set point. So in this slide, we see they have 50 PSI at zero gallons per minute. So at our static flow, we are at 50 gallons per minute in this system. And maybe we turn one faucet on and we stay pretty close to that 50 gallons per minute. But as we get up to our duty point of 20 gallons per minute, when we're washing all our clothes and the kids playing in a sprinkle in the yard, we're taking a shower, um, we start to see that pressure drop. Now this is pressure fall off or pressure drop in the system, which is inherent through the valves. Yeah, we're all familiar with, you put more water through a through a valve or a fitting, you're going to get pressure drops and more volume you start to push through it. So in this slide, we're seeing a 15 PSI differential between our static and our dynamic flow rate at our high flow rate at our total demand for the system. So these are things we need to consider when we're sizing. So once we have this information, we can go to our spec sheets and look at our performance curves on our valves. This performance curve here, I think, is for our 25 AUB off the top of my head. Um, and we're listing half through two inch valves here. So we're going to say we have 100 PSI inlet and a 50 PSI output setting that we're looking for. And we want to go 20 gallons a minute. And we're going to allow a 15 PSI drop. Now, there's nothing you know, sacred about a 15 PSI drop. You only want to allow a 5 PSI drop. We can choose that. We might have a hard time finding a valve at 20 gallons a minute, but we can increase or reduce that pressure drop that we're looking for based on the system and uh, what the owner wants. So we're going to identify across the bottom or x-axis of the graph the 20 gallon per minute that we're looking for, and then we're going to identify the pressure drop we're looking for, a maximum of 15 psi at that 20 gallon a minute flow rate. And then we're going to draw two lines to the point where those two points intersect on our graph. The valve closest to that intersection point is the valve we should select. Now, as I talked earlier, we get a lot of people on PRVs, mixing valves especially. Um, hey, I got a two-inch line. I need a two-inch PRV. Uh, no, you don't. So don't be afraid to put a smaller valve on the system. Because if you put a, based on the flow curves, if you put a valve that's too large on a system, that valve, as you see in this slide, is going to be continuously near in, in a closed position, which is going to cause wear and damage on the seat disc, and the seat itself could cause wire draw on that stainless, and it's going to have to be repaired uh, quite often and um, would just become a nuisance. Um, if we're too small, that valve's going to be open 
mostly most of its life, and we're going to be trying to push too much water through it. And this is when we can get some harmonics in our um, valves, and that's uh, just typical of the mechanics in a valve like this and the water flowing through it. So we want to make sure we use our flow curves when we're sizing these. Um, we did talk about under static pressure, the, ex the thermal expansion property. So thermal expansion in the system uh, will cause the static pressure to increase when the valves are closed, right, when we're not using any water. We all know what thermal expansion is. Somebody takes a shower at night, drains their water heater, shuts off all their valves, goes to bed, and the water heater has fresh cold water in it, and that water is going to expand and has to have somewhere, in, somewhere to expand. As it expands, it's going to cause a downstream increase in pressure in the, in the home. Um, that increase in pressure is released through our thermal bypass, our 25 AUB. Everybody's like, what's the B for? The B is our thermal bypass. It's basically an internal check in our device. You see it here on the screen. I've circled up on the, where to be at on the main body of the valve. The little standard position, it would be closed. These thermal checks are not going to maintain us at our set point but it will release excess pressure in the system once the downstream pressure increases one PSI over the incoming pressure. So if we set it at 50 PSI and we have thermal expansion going on, it's not going to relieve until we're up to 101 if our incoming pressure is 101, uh, and then it will relieve the pressure. Uh, we can also relieve the pressure by, of course, opening anything in the system. If you have a system that you're seeing increases in where you've got it set at 50 and you're like, whoa, it's 90 PSI and we're not flowing, crack a faucet and then shut it back off. Relieve that pressure, and if it doesn't go right back to that 90 PSI or elevated above your set point under a static flow, um, it's probably thermal expansion because it's going to take time to have that pressure increase. Um, all things to consider when you are troubleshooting or sizing a valve. But the easiest way to size a valve would be to visit our website. If you go to our website, watts.com, you can click on the planning tab uh, down towards the middle of the page and then scroll down and it takes you to Watts PRV Sizing Calculator. We can go in here and select our model of what valve we want to sell, kind of based on our market segments as we talked about. We know those 223s are the higher flows. Um, the 25 AUBs have great flow rates. Uh, but more half through two inch valves. We're going to put in our target flow rate, our inlet pressure, our outlet set point, and our minimum outlet pressure at target flow. So if we look at this, we talked about our demands, which would be our 40 gallon a minute. And in this slide, we're going to allow a 20 PSI drop. Uh, we then hit calculate, and it throws back that we need an inch and quarter valve, and it's going to have an expected fall off at 18 PSI at these parameters that we set in. Um, we at Disney McLean are always available to help you size something up. If this is a, a good resource beyond the um, flow curves, if you don't feel comfortable with them, that you can access at any time. So now that we have a valve size and we're ready to install it, how do we install it and where do we install it? Um, typically, when we're putting a valve in, we're doing a single um, stage uh, installation like we see here, where we have city main, we're installing a PRV downstream of the uh, main shutoff valve in the building and after the water meter and feeding the rest of the building. Now, we want to keep in mind, we don't want a ratio lower than three to one. Or, or I'm sorry, higher than three to one, meaning if we have 150 PSI coming in, we don't want to reduce down to 50 PSI through a single valve. That can cause noise and uh, issues with the valve itself. So the second type of installation would be a series or two-stage installation. So if we got 125 PSI coming in and we want to get down to 50, we're going to put two valves in line or in series and reduce the pressure twice to get down to our desired set point. Like I said, this will eliminate hammering and noise 
from harmonics going through the valve in the system. Um, always a good suggestion. Uh, when you're installing these valves, the, the um, direct acting, they can be installed horizontal or vertical, upside down, however you want to put them. That spring and diaphragm don't know what position they are in, and it's not affected by the position on the install of the valve. Always keep in mind you want to have it accessible top and bottom, though, for repairs or adjustments. Uh, the third in, uh, installation would be a parallel regulator installation. You use these when you have um, large flow differentials inside a building. So in this slide, you have two valves side by side, and we see this a lot with our ACVs being, uh, would, an ACV would typically be the valve on the right, but you can do it with two direct acting. So the valve on the right would be a larger valve, and the valve on the left would be a smaller valve typically. And we're going to set that smaller valve five PSI higher than the larger valve to the right. And what that does, as our facility has low flows going in it, um, and we see the pressure start to um, go through the valve at 75 PSI, as the volume of demand increases, you're going to start to have your pressure fall off in the smaller valves. As that valve starts to have the pressure drop through it, and we get down below the 70 PSI range, the larger valve is now going to come open, and we're going to be flowing through both valves to take uh, care of the high water demand in the system. As, we, as our demand starts to drop back off, we will see the larger valve close as that pressure drop um, comes down through the smaller valve and the larger valve will close, and the small valve will take, handle our flows down to the closed point. So it will be ready to go. Um, told you that we're going to talk about why we should choose lots when we're looking for PRVs. Um, we do have the largest uh, selection or uh, range of PRVs on the market. We talked about the market segments a little bit earlier. This is a quick look. Um, we look at our competitors, and we've got a little comparison chart here. We have 13 series of PRVs to offer. Um, if we look at Wilkins, they, they're pretty um, broad as well. Um, we do have some they do not have. And then if you get to like Cash Acme or Combraco, they have very few that can meet up with ours on the commercial and industrial high flow um, quality valves that may, you may need for your application. So we get a lot of questions. So why is this valve more than that valve? Or what are we doing here? Why, why are we selling what? This is a look this here of the internal components that are critical to the PRVs, the diaphragm and the spring. And we're comparing our Watts 25 AUB to the Wilkins 600 here. And if you look at the diaphragm, the larger diaphragm on the left compared to the Wilkins on the right, that larger diaphragm gives us much better flow rates than the Wilkins valves, um, which is going to affect, you know, our sizing. Our, our one-inch valve it may be suitable for an application where their inch and a quarter valve would need to meet the demand in their system because we're going to get better flow rates through it. And then we do have a larger, a longer spring. The longer spring is going to give us a better accuracy when we are adjusting the valve, meaning that as I turn that screw down, I might be able to dial our valve in to maybe half pound increments, not really needed, but um, it helps us get more accuracy than just every two pounds or three pounds of adjustment. As we have a longer spring and more travel in it, it can help us do that. Um, of course, all of our PRVs, like all Watts products, are tested and certified to uh, third-party standards like ASSB, ANSI, IATMO, and NSF. Um, we don't do anything that we put out on the market that is meets the standard or adheres to the standard. All of our spec sheets are going to have the standard listed, and we are certified by those agencies, um, which are required by code in a lot of applications. So that's another key um, point to keep in mind that make sure your valves you're selling do carry the certifications required so you don't get um, in trouble down the road. Um, so in wrapping up, um, 
I hope that everyone has a better understanding of what PRVs are and how they work. Um, I think it's key to see those cutaways where we see that valve throttling open and understanding when you get a PRV, it's actually in the open position because the spring's pushing that disc off the seat in the down motion. It's kind of neat to understand the mechanics of it. Um, and you now have an idea of how to size up the valves using our flow curves and also our sizing um, application on our website that's always at your fingertips. And again, we're always here to help you. If you want additional assistance in that, um, seeing some benefits of our PRV components and that the breadth of range of offering that Watts has to offer um, to all the market segments that would require a PRV. So I appreciate your time. If you have any questions, please let me know. And uh, I hope you, everyone has a good day. Thanks again. Thank you, Jason. Great presentation. Thanks, Jim.